Isaiah 53 is a very famous passage. It's known as a prophecy of Jesus to come prior to His birth. One of the greatest promises out of this prophecy is that Jesus would forgive our sins. At this time of year where we talk about gifts, historically throughout history at harvest time, people would give portions to other people. And they would give things. And it was a time of bounty and plenty. It was a time to be a blessing and give gifts to others. And I want to talk about the greatest gift. And perhaps you, you know, Jesus, obviously the greatest gift. Salvation, the greatest gift. Heaven, the greatest gift. And although all of those are part of what I'm talking about this morning, all of those can also be summarized in this one word, Forgiveness. What if I told you that forgiveness is actually a superpower? And I mean supernatural. It's above the nature of your flesh. It's a spiritual power that you can let God work through you to demonstrate forgiveness to others because He has actually forgiven you of so many great offenses. I want to talk about the power of forgiveness. I want to remind you that in Mark 2 it says that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. I want to first remind you that if you have not received the gift of God, which is eternal life, it says, through Jesus Christ our Lord, you need to receive the forgiveness of sins. When you trust in Jesus, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and He says, and thou shalt be saved, you're believing that the God that will judge our sin has also said, and yet here is your pardon, you're set free. Jesus took your punishment. It's interesting to me in Isaiah 53, it says in verse number 3 that He is a man of sorrows. That means sadness. Look, he says, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Acquainted with grief. Do you know what it means to be acquainted with grief? I do. I mean, if I said, hey, this is my acquaintance, we're good friends, and he's talking about grief. As we saw in Sunday school hour, Jesus had compassion on people. He was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. Look at verse number 4. It says, Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. The promise is, hey, you've sinned, you've broken God's law, there's a punishment you deserve, and yet the Lord Jesus Christ, your very Creator, came in and said, no, let me take the punishment for you, and I'll pay for all your sins, and I'll grant you forgiveness if only you trust in Jesus. What a beautiful promise. How awesome is that? He says in verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. We can't say, I went the Lord's way my whole life. I am without sin. No, no, you've turned. You went your own way. You're doing it your way. And there's a punishment for that. It's called death. It's called, you know, the punishment of sin is death and hell. It's the second death. And yet that was put on him. It was put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's literally paid for it all. Look at verse 10. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. You understand, God the Father saw the travail of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he said, yes, that is sufficient. I'll accept that as a payment. Now I'll give you a grant, to grant forgiveness, to give a pardon to those that have trusted in Christ for salvation. Look, it says, and he shall be satisfied by his knowledge, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. 
What a beautiful promise. Look at the end of verse 12. It says, And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's you. That's me. God's been so good to us. He's paid for all of our sins. He loves us. And he wants to give you the gift. So point number one, take the gift. Get the gift. If you get no other gifts this year, then get the gift of salvation by trusting in the payment that Jesus has made. He's freely offering it to you. All you have to do is receive it by believing it, and you're saved forever. That's His promise. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. There's no sin that's greater than, the, than what Jesus has paid. Get the gift of forgiveness. If you would, go to Malachi chapter 4. That's right before Matthew in the New Testament. Go to Malachi chapter number 4. Forgiveness is the greatest gift. And I, I really believe that there is a superpower inside of you to be able to grant forgiveness to others as well. First, you get the, give, the gift of salvation. That's forgiveness of sins paid by Jesus Christ. Then you get the power to give the gift of reconciliation. And that means you can forgive others that have offended you. You have a power to do that. Hey, you're the bigger man, if you will, or bigger lady. You are now a spiritual person. The Holy Spirit has moved inside of you. And if your neighbor has sinned against you, well, Jesus paid for that sin. And you get to help reconcile them and give God the glory when you reconcile with your neighbor and you say, hey, you know what? You've really sinned against me. You've really hurt me. You don't deserve to be forgiven, but neither did I. And Jesus gave me the gift. And now I want to turn around and in this earthly relationship, I want to reconcile with you. I want to give you the gift of forgiveness. What a powerful place of humility to come from. To be able to humble yourself and make sure you're friend. Malachi 4, when you get there, look at verse number 6. This is a promise of John the Baptist and Jesus. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Here's a promise about Jesus, is that he's going to restore families. If you would, go to Matthew 5. Here's a promise about Jesus, that the gift that God works through you is that you can actually forgive a family member that doesn't deserve to be forgiven. All of us probably have a family member that does not deserve forgiveness. All of us. Thank you, Brother Paul. This is not excluded to just a couple people. Unfortunately, because of human nature, we are all sinners, and some of us are worse than others. And some of us have sinners in our family, and some of the sinners in our family have sinned against us. And I want to show you from the Bible, uh, you know, in, in 1 Peter 3, actually, it talks about that if a husband doesn't treat his wife right, then his prayers will be hindered. First of all, in the spouse relationship, if you're not forgiving the other person to restore the other person and help them grow spiritually, you're withholding your own blessing from God. God's trying to give you a blessing, and you're saying, nope, 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 I don't have to say I'm sorry. I, I, hey, they didn't make it right. They don't deserve it. I know Husbands and wives that the family is split up right now because they will not reconcile and neither one will humble themselves and ask for forgiveness from each other. And if they just would, God would have the glory in their family. I know of other spouses where there was great contention and strife and the one forgave the other even though they didn't deserve it. And God blesses the one that gave forgiveness. God protected them from letting that root of bitterness to grow in their heart. God began to bless mightily those that were willing to forgive somebody that simply doesn't deserve it. What a beautiful picture of salvation. Listen, if we're called by the name of Christ, then why can't we just forgive like Christ did? You're in Matthew 5, look at verse 23. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, uh, he's talking about bringing a financial gift to the house of the Lord. A gift is above the tithe. The tithe just means 10%. This would be an offering. He says, hey, I've got something extra I want to give to God. I really want God's blessing. And I want to show God I'm thankful. I'm going to give a gift 
totally free. He says, if thou bring their gift to the altar, and there, once you get to the altar, rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee. If we could visualize that, let's call this the altar. I, I, I must say, these are not altars, these are steps where the altar is mentioned in Exodus 20 where we get the Ten Commandments. It talks about not to make steps to the altar. And I know in church tradition they'll say, bring it down to the altar and you bow down at the steps. And literally, the Bible literally says in Exodus 20, don't bow down at steps at the altar. We shouldn't do that. An altar in the Christian life is in your heart. Back then they would bring something to the house of the Lord. I'm going to set it on the altar. It's going to be a sacrifice that will be uh, given for whatever purpose. I'm hands off. It's done. And he says, you get to the altar and then the Lord reveals something to you because you come in humility and you come in service and you want to bring something because you really want to please God. You want God's blessing on your life and you begin to give something and then the Holy Spirit inside of you says, I'm glad to see you submit and I'm glad to see you humble. But by the way... You have a brother that is offended by you. And you can make it right. He says, if you bring your gift to the altar and you have a brother that has aught against you. Look at it, verse 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there, at that place, rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. He says, when you get here with the gift, he says, don't take the gift with you. He says, no, no, no. Uh, gentlemen, I'll be right back for this, to give it to God. I have to go deal with the business that God is showing me. I've got some business in my family. I have a brother that I've offended, and I haven't reconciled with him yet. And I can't in good conscience give something to God until I fix the problem with my brother. How can I be right with God and wrong with my brother? This is a heavy thing. Forgiveness does not come easily, especially when they don't deserve it. When they have done you wrong and you are in the right, man, that just feeds your pride. It feeds the flesh to be able to say, why should I? I don't even have to. In fact, you know what? Forget them. I don't even need them at all. Is that what Christ did? Did he do that to you? Or did he forgive you the sins that you don't deserve to be forgiven of? He says, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Go to the next chapter, chapter 6. Go to chapter 6. There are people in here that probably have contention with siblings, and you have it in your power to solve the problem. Period. Yeah, but you don't know where they're coming from. It doesn't matter. They're still in the wrong. That's okay. Let God judge that part of it. You just teach them a lesson on forgiveness by being the little glimmer of light that Jesus is in you, being that little glimmer of the true light in their life. Yeah, but they say they're a Christian too. Yeah, but do you have the true light in you? In chapter 6, uh, look at verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Uh-oh, wait a minute. Is my forgiveness based upon how I forgive others? This could be a problem. Now, once you believe on Jesus for salvation... All of your sins are permanently paid for in eternity. Once saved, always saved. There's no losing your salvation. However, in your relationship with your Father, when you refuse to do what He says, there's a problem until you obey. I have multiple children. If one of them is angry with their sibling, and I say, make it right, and they are they still my child? Of course. Are they in obedience to me? Is the relationship between us going well? So now what happens is that contention and strife goes upward. I can't believe God would want me to forgive my brother, my sister. My, I mean, come on, think about it. He forgave you, didn't he? You don't deserve it. Look in verse 14. 
For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Guys, in your Christian walk, in your Christian walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to stumble in sin. And sometimes God will be merciful to you and long-suffering and patient, and He won't correct you very hard because you have a good relationship. You have a broken and a contrite spirit. And you're keeping a short account with God where when you sin, you're like, I'm sorry, Lord, it's me again. I'm, just, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, Lord. And you keep coming back to Him. The flip side is those that would say, well, I'm good. <laughs> what do I have to worry about? I mean, look at me. I don't look like them. I don't do what they do. I don't smell like them, and I don't go where they go, and I don't talk like they talk, and I don't drink what they drink, and smoke what they smoke, and eat what they... I don't do all that stuff. I'm good. And God says, yeah, but you got a heart problem, and it's wicked, and it's a root of bitterness, and it's pride that would make you think you're better than somebody else, and look down on somebody and push them down. And when you do that, you are not representing the Lord Jesus Christ. You are letting the devil in your house. Now, as a Christian, we have an opportunity to reconcile relationships. And if you want God to forgive you when you stumble, then why don't you forgive those that sin against you? Go to Matthew 18, please. Matthew chapter 18. Look at verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone, and then put it on Facebook. I'm sorry, that's not in there. Uh, let's try that again. Uh, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone, and if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Notice, this is actually a pattern, and we're going to look at a parallel to this in Luke 17 in a moment. He's giving you some instructions. Jesus introduced the church in Matthew 16. Here in Matthew 18, he's dealing with church discipline. I've got a problem with one guy. I'm going to go to him, a fellow Christian. And he says, we're butting heads. Go to him first. Win your brother. The point of rebuking somebody is so that you can restore them as a friend. This is always the goal. If the point is to show off that you think you're better than them, then you're in sin. You are not filled with the Holy Spirit while you do that. There are brothers and sisters in church that will sit across the pew from each other and they'll hold a grudge for decades. And that's a sin. That's a sin. Look, he says, tell thy brother. And why? Verse 15 at the end, and thou hast gained thy brother. There's the goal. Now go to verse 35. Go to verse 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also with you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one of his brother their trespasses. This story was the servant that was forgiven of, I don't know, millions of dollars. I'm free, oh Lord, please I'll pay it all back. He had compassion on him. He'll let you go. You know what? This one's on me, buddy. God bless you. You're free to go. And he goes out and he finds somebody else that owes him a little and he grabs him by the neck and says, pay me everything. I'm going to lock you up and take your family from you. And when the Lord hears about it, he says, what are you doing? I've forgiven you a millions and you're going to hate your brother over 10 bucks? Lock you up. And look at verse 35, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Go to Luke 6. This is a hard saying, because technically, I don't have to forgive anybody until they make it right. Technically. However, the Holy Spirit that worked through Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. The Holy Spirit that worked through Stephen when they stoned him to death, he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And the man named Saul that became the Apostle Paul was standing there in the crowd, and then he took that same spirit. When they tried to kill him, he was praying for them. I mean, that's the kind of Christian I want to be. I'd rather be the guy that they thought they got one up on me, and the Lord says, well done. Thou good and faithful servant, thank you for being humble this once. Then, then to be the guy that says, I got them. Well, I showed them. 
I'm better than them. I, I know I'm smarter than you. I was right and you were wrong and I proved it and I don't have to forgive you. We call people like that a jerk. <laughs> Jesus wasn't a jerk. Hey, Jesus preached hard to the Pharisees when it was, when it was time. They were the false prophets preaching a false gospel, hurting the people of God in the house of God. I mean, boy, he, he didn't spare anything. He called them snakes and vipers and wolves and said they have a hotter hell. Those are harsh words from the Lord. In Luke, where are you at? Luke 6, right? Join me in Luke 6, verse 26, please. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. This does not come naturally. This requires a superpower of the Holy Spirit working in you. Christ in me. I can't do it on my own. I need His help. To bless them that curse me? Can you imagine somebody literally using an expletive, a curse word at you? Blah, 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 you. You say, hey man, don't curse me. God bless you. I can see that you don't have any joy in your life and I'll just pray the Lord will help you. I was talking with somebody this past week and they said that this person where they were working, they did this, they cussed and, you know, they hated everybody in one and they came to another and they're like, oh, they're coming to the office, you're going to have to deal with them next. And they started just cussing and ranting and I want it my way and you, you better make it right. And using Jesus' name as a cuss word and the person I was speaking to, they said, I'm not very bold. I didn't feel like it's my job. I'm not the kind of person to get up and like fiery rebuke somebody. And I didn't know what to say. And I said, I don't want to say anything. And I felt the Holy Spirit working in me. And all of a sudden it was like, all of a sudden I just said, why don't we just leave him out of this? And they said, I couldn't believe I said it. <laughs> That's what we call speaking the truth in love. Well, you love in Jesus this. And Je why don't we just leave him out of this? The response was, the person that was misusing the Lord's name and had such a, a furious, frustrating time, it was like somebody hit him in the head. They were literally like, well, 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 I'm guessing they probably didn't really truly intend to take the name of their Lord Jesus Christ, their Creator, and stomp on it and defile it for their glory to show how mad they were, but they did. And it hit him like a ton of bricks, like, whoa, I, 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 I wasn't trying to bring him into it, but I see what you, whoa. And they just left. I want to remind you that you have spiritual power to forgive those that have no joy. While you're in Luke 6, look at verse 35. But love your enemies and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. That means give them the money. Somebody says, hey man, can I get 20 bucks? You say, here you go. I, I promise I'll pay it back on my, you know what? Here, it's a gift. God bless you. I'm not expecting anything back. Oh, thank you. No, thank God. It's his money. You thank him for being kind to you, right? He says, and your reward shall be great. When you love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, he says, your reward will be great. I do believe that he's very clearly, specifically talking about the judgment seat of Christ when we stand before the Lord. But I also believe that the Lord will reward you and bless you and protect you here on this earth as well. I believe it's a twofold reward. Physically, immediately, and eternally, eventually, when you get there. He says, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Why is God kind to evil people? That just doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, you're evil too. <laughs> evil means harmful, and we do things of our own mind. I know what we'll do. I know what we got to do to fix the problem, and we harm people. 
If we would just stop and ask for the mind of Christ and ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit and pray about the situation and pray for the person that we're dealing with, especially when you're at odds with them, and ask the Lord to use you, then you might have an opportunity where somebody's expecting strife from you, and instead they turn around and they say, they really are the children of the highest. Like, I've met a lot of Christians that are hypocrites of that person that just did that to me. Like, wow, I couldn't do that. If I ever was a Christian, I don't want to be one of those kinds of Christians. We've got to let them see the love of Christ in our life. He says in verse 36, Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. These are great promises. Forgive others, and God will make sure He takes care of you here. Verse 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. We use this as an illustration. I don't know, about six months ago, a year ago, I had Elijah, he had a jar and we took some measuring cup and we were filling it up with brown sugar and it got to the top. You remember this, guys? And then what'd he do? Well, he pressed it down. And then he put the lid on and he shook it together. And it was full and then all of a sudden there's this much extra room. And so I gave him another good measure and I gave him another good measure and we did this a couple times until it was literally flowing over and there was a mess on the floor. Sorry, ladies, right? In the carpet, I know my wife was going, ah, oh, what's he doing? <laughs> you know? But what a great illustration of the love of God that he says, you give to others this way and don't worry, I'll take care of you. And in fact, the same way you forgive to others in that way and don't worry, I'll take care of you. Are you forgiving people in a good measure? Ah, don't worry about it. It's all paid for on the cross anyway. I mean, that would really surprise somebody. Go to Luke 17. I want to show you the forgiveness rule. I want to explain this to you. Luke chapter 17. Again, I just want to remind you that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. And so do you. You have the power to forgive people that don't deserve it. You have that power. And when you do it, you're not doing it for your own glory or your own power. You have to do it with a humble mind and a humble spirit. You can't just come and say, hey, that thing from years ago, I'm sorry, no big deal. No, the better way would be, hey, you know what? God has convicted me through His Word that I'm wrong, and I love you. I'm sorry. Let's reconcile. Let's not end our lives wondering what's up with the other person and end up dying and not having an opportunity to reconcile with somebody. In Luke 17, look at verse number 1. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him, through they come. He said, guess what? Everybody's going to get offended. Things are going to happen. But be careful if you're the offender, he's saying. In fact, in verse 2, It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than he should offend one of these little ones. This is, I mean, Jesus has some hard preaching in Matthew 23 against the false prophets. But right here, he just said a child offender is better off to hang themselves and drown themselves than to offend children. Amen. That's a big deal. Jesus is reminding us that there's a death penalty for certain offenses in the Old Testament. There is a law, and some people in here probably have crossed the line with God and broken some of his laws. That, I mean, you know, you know, adultery is worthy of death. You know, fornication is worthy of death in the Bible. Child offender. Jesus is reminding, hey, you offend one of these children, you're better off to just end your life right now. I mean, whoa, these are harsh words. And then Jesus shines a little light for us. Look what he says in verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. There are people that have been offended by others and they're told, no, no, don't say anything, don't speak up. Just brush it under the rug. God forbid, that's a sin. Take heed to yourself. He's saying, stand up for yourself. Protect the body that God's given you. Protect the mind. If somebody's trying to mess with you, you stand up and you say, I don't want to hear it. Get it away from me. And you protect yourself. Take heed. First step. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee. Aha, here it is. 
somebody has sinned against me, what do I do? Well, he gives us these rules. Rebuke him. Brother, you have sinned against me. Brother Chad, I've had it with you. You keep parking behind my truck and I can't get out. You've offended me. I'm done with you. <laughs> Stand up for yourself. There's a time and a place for that. Not everybody is an alpha personality willing to do that. Maybe your method would be, excuse me, brother, would you mind kind of giving me, remembering me next time you park? Because I sure do hate it when you're right there and I feel like I'm going to hit somebody or something. And if you could help me out, it would be great. I mean, whatever that rebuke looks like, whether it's a soft reproof or it's a offense worthy of a strong rebuke. He says, man, if somebody has, has offended you, you must rebuke them. And this is important because if you never rebuke them and say, remember that thing? You offended me. They might say, remember what thing? I don't actually remember it. Oh, that hurt your feelings? I'm sorry. I, I didn't know that. If you never rebuke them, they don't have a chance for restoration. The parallel in Matthew 18 is restoring your brother, winning your friend back. That's the goal, is to win them back. But if they don't realize, a couple kids out playing, one on a bicycle runs right over the toes of somebody else. Ah! And they keep going. And they run off to mama. If they're never told that they hurt them, there's never an opportunity for true reconciliation. And if you're not careful, the other person may begin to get more bitter. They may begin to kind of clam up and internalize things. Come on, don't you want to ride bikes? No. I usually get hurt. They begin to be self-conscious about, maybe I'm not that good on my bike. I'm always going to get hurt. Maybe I'm part of the problem. They always hurt me. They're just mean. And the other person has no idea what they did. If somebody offends you, it's your job to rebuke them, not of, out of pride, but out of an opportunity for them to reconcile, to make it right. He says, what's the next one? If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. If he repent. Oh, I'm sorry. Or, or, you know, what's the big deal? Get your foot out from under my bike anyway. Well, that's not repentance, Right? Well, you had it coming. You deserved it. That's not repentance. Repent means to change your mind. Sin, I hope you get reconciled with God, and I just want to reconcile with you before we die. I love you. I'm not fond of your sin. You can keep it away. But I just let you know that between you and me, I forgive you. Wouldn't the Lord get glory in something like that? They may still want to stay away from you like two opposing magnets anyway. Oh, those Christians. But I mean, that was nice of them to forgive me. You just leave it in the Lord's hands. Amen. Ephesians 4. <clears throat> Very quickly, let me read part of this chapter. Well, look at verse 22. He says, That ye put off <clears throat> concerning the former conversation the old man. Uh, your conversation is your walk and your talk. It's what people say about you. Your conversation, he says, put off the old man. You used to be one way. He says, get away from that. He says, uh, put off the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. There are people that are caught in this right now that you can't wake them up, but one day maybe they will, where they're stuck. They're uh, drawn away of their own lust. They're in bondage to their sin. They're corrupted, they're deceived, and they don't know it. And maybe you can just come through and shine a little light in their life to wake them up to see the love of God. Maybe you have a chance. But when you're walking in the old man, walking in the flesh, and you're acting of your own uh, vengeance, you fail to let Christ win in your life. He says in verse 23, and be renewed. That means a new mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You know, uh, God has made you a new man inside already or a new woman. The question is, can others see it? It's already happened spiritually, but the more you submit to his will and walk in holiness, it's evident to others, and then God gets the glory as you begin to change your life for better. Verse 25, he says, wherefore, putting away lying. Now here he's going to talk about some words. I've talked about this before. You know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. That's a lie. 
Words hurt. They go in the heart. They hurt people for a long time. Don't believe that. Be very careful with your words. Be very sensitive to other people. Be very considerate of what you say. Your, God's word is called a seed that goes into the heart of man. Well, your words are much the same way. What are you planting in other people's gardens? What's he saying in Proverbs, uh, what is it, 18, 21, that there's power of death and life in the tongue? You can put seeds of death in the heart of the people around you if you're not careful. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. We ought to be known as people of truth. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. I got it. Be ye angry. I've heard people stop right there. Hey, it says I can be angry. Well, keep reading. There's no period there. There's a comma. You can be angry with sin, but he says sin not. Well, my spouse offended me, and I, I do well to be angry. Isn't that what he said? I do well to be angry, even unto death. That's what Jonah said. I am, yeah, I'm mad. But he said, be angry and sin not. You know what happens in our relationships? We allow ourselves to be angry, and that tingling, boy, it feels good in the flesh. I was right, and I got one up on them. You're no longer walking in the spirit. You're in the old man. You're in the flesh. You're giving glory to the wrong spirit. Be angry and sin not. Uh, what this means is, in your relationships, notice what he says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. That means you fix it that day. You end it that night. You don't carry this spirit for three days. Amen. I do well to be angry. I can't believe you said that, did that, didn't do what I want. I can't believe it. I'm just going to show you for the next three days. Mm -hmm. Give me the silent treatment. Well, that's not of the Lord. We're supposed to reconcile and forgive each other. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. If you're angry in the morning from something yesterday, you are in sin. Period. You're in sin. Notice the next verse. Neither give place to the devil. When you get angry in your house and you stir up that kind of controversy and strife, you might as well walk over and open the front door and say, come on in, devil. I got a place for you and my family. Have a seat. Get acquainted. Make yourself comfortable. Can we get you anything? Mi casa, su casa. Do you really want to do that with the devil and your families and your relationships and your friends and your extended family and your workplace? Because that's what happens when you don't forgive people, when you get angry at people and you just cross your arms and you say, I'm not listening to you. I'm going to do it my way. And you say, come on in, devil. God forbid. God forbid. Because that root of bitterness, Hebrews 12 talks about that, that there's a root of bitterness that takes root and it will grow into a great tree if you're not careful. And you're not going to like the fruit of it. Uh, the fruit of the, uh, the, 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 the no, what was it, in, uh, Proverbs 18, 21, the, the um, help me out somebody, let me see, the, they shall eat the fruit thereof. Uh, um, there's power of death and life in the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. There's power of death and life in my tongue. If I'm planting life, I'll love the fruit when that tree grows. And if you're planting death in somebody else, it's going to come back on you. That fruit will hurt you. And boy, get ready. That's the fruit you've planted. He says in verse 27, Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. What does edify mean? Build up. It means to build up. Your words should make people grow spiritually, is what he's saying. Your words should not be corrupt and hateful and destructive. You need to help restore people and build people, help them grow up in Christ, edifying them. And he says, ministering grace, verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Isn't that interesting? We all know that there's a verse in there somewhere about not grieving the Holy Spirit, but did you know it's about what you let come out of your mouth to other people? 
He compares it to giving place unto the devil with the words in your mouth. And then he warns us that you're hurting the Holy Spirit. You know what grieve means? Like, oh, man. How can I, what's a good analogy? Like if Brother Chad was watching me tighten down a bolt and I just stripped the bolt and I just kept going crunch. And he's like, oh, don't do that. No, <laughs> no, right? I mean, think, grieving the Holy Spirit, he's right there with you. And he's like, don't do it, don't do it. And you're like, let me do it my way. Come on in, devil. And then you say whatever you want to say. And those fiery darts come out of your mouth. And they attack somebody that you love. And God said, forgive them. I'm not asking you to let people just run over you. Although Jesus did say, turn the other cheek. I'm not asking you to let people abuse you. But if you don't let some things go, then you're the one that's hurting yourself. We need to forgive like Christ. Look at verse 31. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. Clamor is like loud shouting, fighting. The warns of a clamorous woman. Oh, he's, hey, hey, what's going on over there? If you ever heard people arguing, you're like, what is all that clamor? Like, whoa, stay away from that. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Verse 32 is a verse worth memorizing. If you'll let God get glory in your life, you will be tender to the needs of others. You will be kind to what other people think. Be kind one to another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. None of us that are holding a grudge or that are not forgiving or not pardoning our brothers or sisters or parents or children or friends or coworkers, none of us can stand before God and say, yeah, but they sinned against me, God. He's going to say, so have you. And I forgave you. And I'm asking you to forgive them. Humble yourself. Let them get one up on you. Go ahead. Suffer a little. And grant them a pardon. Give them the gift of reconciliation. Give them the gift of forgiveness. It is the, literally the greatest gift in this whole world. And the lost world doesn't understand it. God help us to forgive each other. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. And Lord, I just pray that you would use these words, these verses, to sink down in our heart. Lord, I ask that you would reveal to us if there's folks that we need to reconcile with, if we have people in our family and our friends and our past that we just need to reach out to and humble ourselves and make sure our friend and say, I love you, I'm sorry. God, I ask that you would give us the spiritual strength to do it, that you might get the glory and you might get the victory in our lives. Lord, while there's time, give us the strength to let you win by forgiving others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.